So for the purpose of this review session, let's say that the, uh, let's say that the rotational inertia of the rod is given. Um, one easy way I can give that to you is by giving you a uniform rod. If I were to give you a uniform rod, then pivot is at the end. You can look it up from a table of rotational inertia that says about an end point, rotational inertia of a rod is one third ml squared. You could do that. Bunch of different things you can do. <laughs> so, um, so with a small modification, let me just work through this question to show you what kind of uh, rigid body rotation you could be looking at on exam term. This, uh, by the way, is about 20 to 30% of your exam. It's the remaining or 30 to 20% of your exam. So I do want you to focus first on conservation of energy and momentum questions. And this is kind of the last bit that you would cover if you feel comfortable with all the other topics co being covered on your exam too. So, all right. Um, so, it says a uh, non-uniform bar, we won't worry about that part. Uh, the linear, we once again won't worry about the part where X is the distance from the pivoted end point. The bar is allowed to swing down from rest in order to. Figure below shows the position of the bar after some time as it falls, when the bar makes an angle theta with the horizontal. It says, draw a free body diagram indicating all forces on the bar. Oh, use the figure to draw forces on, all right, let me erase that. Um, draw forces on, uh, on your, okay, so let's just start by drawing the forces. <laughs> um, so there's gonna be gravity, there's always gravity. So um, that gravity is gonna be pulling this, uh, sent, uh, pulling this downward, and I can draw gravity as acting on the center of mass. So this downward force of mg is what I should draw uh, at the center of mass. Now, here's a kind of an interesting thing. If you imagine the motion of this uh, rod, it kind of moves along this circular arc, right? This is how it's moving, which means it has some horizontal component of acceleration, but there's no horizontal component of gravity. So how is it accelerating horizontally? This is where you have to remember that when there's a pivot point, there can be force and torque at the pivot. So I'm going to just draw a reminder to myself that there may be some force at the pivot point. And I guess uh, I want it to be going generally upward and I guess a little bit to the left to, to account for that somehow left towards net force. So there's going to be some kind of force at pivot and in this particular case, as long as there's no friction on the pivot, the torque should be zero. All right, um, let me get rid of this non-forced labels. So, okay, so there are those two forces, a contact force and gravitational force. Um, and the two says on my free body diagram, indicate the lever arm for the torque due to gravitational force. Um, uh, I think that's the one thing that we haven't quite covered. Um, so I think other than that it appears on this question, normally people won't have any reason to worry about this. So let me just, just put it this way. You do not need to worry about how to, this particular procedure for finding lever arm. Uh, let me do that as part of your static equilibrium. So you will have to deal with that for your exam three. So this will be for exam three. Uh, for those of you who might be studying ahead, um, just so that you can see what the answer is, this is how I would indicate the lever arm by extending the uh, force, the line of force, so that I can drop down a perpendicular segment from the pivot point to that line of force perpendicular here, then this is what we call lever arm. But I don't think any of the lecture videos you have uh, makes reference to this. And <laughs> so I won't, will not be testing you on lever arm on your exam. Okay, 
uh, the torque due to gravitational force about the people. Okay, find the angular acceleration of the rod. Uh, I think that actually you should be able to do even without knowing anything about lever arm because you should know this the Newton second law for rotational motion. Net torque is equal to the rotational inertia times angular acceleration. And you should have enough sense that the only source of torque is coming from the gravitational force. So torque due to gravity is equal to um, mg times the length um, ah, xcm. So xcm is indicated by this. This is x center of mass times x center of mass. And I need a sign of and then theta should be the angle between the displacement vector and the uh, force. This angle here, unfortunately, that's not the theta over there. Um, let me call this phi, so sine of phi. Now that phi is same phi as this phi, uh, which means that's uh, 90 degrees minus theta. So it's a, a is it called a supplementary complement a complementary angle? So sine of phi is equal to cosine of theta. So this should be mg x center of mass cosine of theta is equal to that's the net torque. So that should be equal to the rotational inertia of the rod times the angular acceleration. Now I have enough information to solve for angular acceleration by saying, all right, it's Angular acceleration is equal to everything on the left-hand side, the net torque, divided by the rotation inertia. So that's the answer to three. Uh, oh, I guess three is it. <laughs> Good, so that's the angular acceleration at this particular angular position. And hopefully that makes sense. When theta is equal to zero, when the bar is completely horizontal, that's when the angular acceleration is greatest. And when the bar is uh, completely vertical is when the angular acceleration goes to zero. Um, because then, the, yeah. Okay. Um, so we are skipping B. You don't need to do this for exam too. Um, let's look at C. Find the maximum angular velocity of the rod if the rod is released from rest in a horizontal position. And um, hopefully as you look at this question, you have this intuitive sense that, all right, so I'm releasing the rod from this completely horizontal position. Then, um, so it's starting out from V is equal to uh, or uh, let's deal with angular velocity. You're starting out with omega equal to zero. It starts out from rest. And hopefully you have a good enough of intuition to say, oh, it, this is going to reach maximum angular velocity as it's swinging down. It's going to reach that maximum angular velocity when it's at this vertical position. This is when it's moving with omega maximum. That makes sense? Yes. <laughs> no real time questions, but anyway, so, so that intuitive feel is important because the, the, the question doesn't tell you when you reach the, the maximum angular velocity, but um, under some reasonable assumptions, like it's, a, uh, it's a swinging down frictionlessly and all that stuff, um, this uh, intuitive sense that it's uh, at this uh, position where omega maximum is reached. That has to be your starting place for answering this question. So you need to have that intuition. And once you have that, then as you look at these uh, two snapshots, I hope you realize that uh, this problem can be solved using conservation of energy. That um, everything in this setup like you have gravitational force acting here, and especially if you're assuming frictionless motion, then it's a setup where energy ought to be conserved. So you should use conservation of energy. Once you um, come that far, then you write down conservation equation. 
conservation law equation. So you say initial kinetic energy plus initial potential energy is equal to, so that's my snapshot here. This is what I'm going to call I is equal to my final kinetic energy plus final potential energy. That's uh, what I'm going to call this snapshot here. And uh, let me do something a little bit unusual here because of the geometry. I'm going to set this as my reference point. Y is equal to zero. Then initial kinetic energy is zero because uh, it's starting out from rest. And because of how I set up the reference point, initial potential energy is also zero. Um, all right. Um, so let's uh, write down what we can write down. Then the left-hand side is equal to zero. For the right-hand side, uh, I'm going to, all of this kinetic energy is rotational kinetic energy. So I'll write down one half rotational inertia of the rod that I know somehow. And then I need a speed squared. So here it'll be uh, maximum. And yeah, so om I'll write down omega max squared. All right, so that's kinetic energy. Plus the uh, potential energy in this final position. The only potential energy there is the gravitational potential energy. And it's uh, below the, um, it's below the reference point at the distance of that center of mass. Um, so, you know, I treat gravitation, for the purpose of calculating gravitational potential energy, I treat that expand, extended body as being a point mass at that point. So my gravitational potential energy is going to be, uh, I already wrote that plus, plus um, mgh. So mass of the rod, m, times g, and here I'm going to be careful with the height. The height will be minus the, the um, position of the center of mass, 5L over g, uh, sorry, not g, 9. So, so you can see how it will work out. The first term is positive, but the second term is negative. So when they add together, they will add up to zero. So it's okay that initially you start out with a zero energy. It's because it's only the change in potential energy that's meaningful. So here what's meaningful is that as the, as the rod swings down, the potential energy is decreasing from zero to a more negative value. Um, so hopefully everyone can do this al remaining algebra here to solve this for omega max. And when you do that, this is what it ends up being. Omega max is equal to, um, well, let me just combine all those numerical factors. 10 over nine MGL over I rod, all things square rooted. Um, if you know the expression for I rod, then some of the things like M and L will cancel out. So. All right, uh, so that's part C. And, um, Oh, party. Suppose the rod is pivoted about the other point, then it, it's the exact same thing. The only thing that uh, changes, and I guess uh, it's uh, um, the only thing that's uh, meant to be tricky with this question here is I think most people will get that this change in gravitational potential energy will now be different because how far this center of mass falls will now be different. The one thing that uh, people sometimes miss is that your I rod changes because when you are spinning your rod by this far end point versus when you're spinning it by this closer end point, closer to the center of mass, your uh, rotation inertia of the rod changes. So at least for that question, that was the way uh, it was meant to be tricky. <laughs> uh, if I use a uniform rod, then it shouldn't matter. Um, but yeah, that's a kind of what the question is getting at. I guess I'll just leave that.